Okay, class, let's get started. Uh, we're going to start with an eye clicker today. So, everyone, if you haven't already done so, get out your eye clickers. I'd like to know which of the following should you put in your microwave at home? Do you remember these things? I haven't seen one of these in a few years. But these are called CDs, compact discs. This one stores, uh, this is a quick restore CD provided by Compaq, 2001. Um, so CDs, that's A. B, aluminum foil. We have some nice cooking aluminum foil. I have some matches up here. Should you put a lit match in your microwave? Um, how about a light bulb? I mean, how crazy can that get? I think most microwaves already have light bulbs in them. It can't be cr that crazy, right? Should. I, I wrote home. So the question is, should you put it in a microwave you don't want to damage? Maybe I should put it that way. And then E, are you insane? That's, you should not do any of those things. Take about one more minute. All right, take about 10 more seconds. Lock in your votes. Okay. All right. I don't know the answer to this one. Um, we'll see if we can find out. Let's do one more eye clicker question. This is eye clicker question number two. How about, I'm going to rephrase it. How about which of the following? Should we micro? <laughs> All right, let's vote on that one. We're going to do it by vote. OK, there we go. People want to see, looks like some people want to see a lip match. All right. I'm getting higher participation already in this one. All right. This is good. I think people are voting from afar. Twenty-eight more seconds. <laughs> I have seven people. It's probably the seven people closest to the microwave that are saying E. You're safe. Maybe. All right. Uh, seven more seconds. Lock in your votes. People still voting? All right. People are still voting. OK. People want to see uh, that lit match first. Okay, we'll do that first. But first, we have to figure out this is not this is not just crazy. This is not just crazy fun time. We have to talk about why in the heck I would want to do some of those things in a physics class in a class called How Things Work. So, quick review from last class. Uh, last class was our first class after spring break, and I mentioned we're going to get out of the world of the macro and we're going to get as small as we actually possibly can. We're going to spend pretty much the rest of this semester dealing with these guys. These are our 17 fundamental particles. Now, we're not going to deal with all these. There's not too many uh, experiments we can do here in room 203 that have to do with bottom quarks. But we're going to zoom in on some of these guys. Right now, we're zoomed in on the photon. 
So all of these guys are fundamental particles, meaning they have no substructure as far as we know. Now, string theorists right now are trying to see if that's actually true, but right now our understanding of the world is that we've done it, we've, we've, which is crazy. We've actually zoomed in as far as you can go. So go us. We've actually subdivided and subdivided and subdivided until we've actually reached the place where we don't think you can subdivide anymore. And the, that's how nature will organize energy if you give it the chance. Give that nature some energy, it might organize it into a tau uh, neutrino, it might organize itself into a W boson, something like that. Right now we're focused on the photon. Here's why the photon is of particular interest. Photon is where, a photon is light. And so even though we only, I think, just in the last couple centuries even have had the slightest clue what light is, and only in the last couple decades are really starting to get a good understanding of it, it is something that we've all been awash in since the beginning of our species. And so it's always around us. The sun shines light on us, well, depending on where you live, about half the day. We've got fire, we've got other sources of light. So it's something we're all very familiar with, but we've only recently really begun to understand what it is. And we now know it's a photon. And so here's some things you need to know about photons. It's a wave. It's a wave of electric field and magnetic field. So we saw that last class. So we saw uh, last class with the laser up here, we saw the double slit experiment. And the double slit experiment was when the laser went through two openings, it created an interference pattern. That right there is your pretty conclusive proof light's a wave. If light was particles, the light would have just created two spots on the screen on the other side. But it created what is very uh, typical of an interference pattern. There, there's pretty solid proof, thanks to Young in like 1800, light is a wave. Okay, so we now know it's a wave. Then we go through that whole michelson morley experiment, wave of what? Is there some ether that permeates all space? Turns out, no. Turns out that light is a wave in space itself and it's a wave of electric field and magnetic field. It's a wave of electric field, magnetic field. It travels in a straight line, but along that straight line are two orthogonal oscillations, magnetic and electric. So I mentioned that last class. I don't want to get confused. You don't want to, th based on that picture, you don't want to think that light does this. Light travels in straight lines, but the field is oscillating in two orthogonal directions. Okay. And then somebody asked a really good question last class. Why, I, I forget the, class, the exact question, but like, why does light not pass through, why does light not pass through me, or why does it pass through some stuff? And here's the thing, light is, there's not a whole lot to characterize light. It's sizeless, it's massless, it's chargeless, it goes always the same speed, it's tasteless, smellless, colorless, there's not much to distinguish it. However, if you, so it always goes the same speed, that's C up there, 186,000 miles a second or 300 million meters per second. It always goes the same speed, so pretty much the only thing to distinguish one light particle from another is its frequency and wavelength. And those two vary in tandem, because if C is a constant, if frequency goes up, wavelength goes down, or vice versa. So if you want to know the properties of a light, a light wave or a photon, you really have, just have to know its wavelength. That'll, that'll tell you the rest of the story. And what's cool about photons is if you change the wavelength or frequency, the properties that result are vastly variable. And so one of the eye clickers I was going to use, I think I won't. Here, what, here it was. Let's put it up here. Oh, it was, it was, yeah, it was next. This is not an eye clicker. You don't have to answer this one. This was going to be one of the questions. And is, which of the following is not an electromagnetic radiation? And the answer is none. They all are. And so this thing called a photon, this massless, sizeless, tasteless, smellless, chargeless particle that always goes the same speed, it's responsible for a vast array of things that not, I think not everyone under, I think, I don't know if it's common knowledge, that lots of things you experience and use every day are just photons. So if you tune into the AM radio in your car, that's photons. If you tune into FM radio in your car, that's photons. If you make a cell phone call and use cellular data, that's photons. If you use a Wi-Fi signal, that's photons. If you get a sunburn, that's photons. If you use a remote control, that's photons. If you are seeing anything right now, that's photons. If you ever go to the doctor and get an x-ray, that's photons. If you're ever near 
a nuclear disaster and you get radiation poisoning. That's also photons. So photons are lots of, let's see, and heat. Oh, and heat, yeah. If you've ever, if you've ever been around something above absolute zero, that's photons. If you've ever put your hand in front of a radiator or a fire or anything else and thought, hey, that's kind of warm, that's photons. If you've ever walked outside and it was above absolute zero outside, that was photons. So it's pretty much a vast array of what we experience every day is just one thing. These little massless, chargeless particles going the speed of light, the only difference being their frequency. OK, so I've got, yes, question, Caitlin. Um, like I said last class, I think physics went through the, wrestled with this whole wave particle duality for a long time. Um, I think we can pretty much safely say wave. Now, these are uh, uh, my, my chart up there a second ago, that was a list of particles and uh, particle physics. This is the standard model of particle physics. So we currently understand all of everything in the universe to be under, made of these particles. So that's a particle. There it is, photon, particle. But if you zoom in on that particle, there's no like bit or chunk. And that's the thing I, th I want to make sure we don't mistake. So there is no, these things are manifested as, yeah, that, that is, it's, so I guess here's the thing I should say. Um, these things don't look like anything we're familiar with. And so it's hard to describe them. So uh, we're, we're familiar with waves. Go to the beach, there's waves. And we're familiar with particles, baseballs, footballs, and all that. These are neither, but they're pretty much waves, but they, you can get them to manifest as particles, but it's still a wave, but that wave is just in a very uh, specific spot. So just, I think we could avoid a lot of, the, oh, it's a wave and it's a particle. Because I think we went through this long period where, oh, look, there's light exhibiting its wave-like behavior. Oh, there's light exhibiting its particle-like behavior. I think that confuses the issue. I think we can say, light's a wave. Um, we, we have wave, wave math describes it very well. Uh, when I observe it, I, I can think of it as a, as a particular spot, and I'm like, I might call it a particle. Yeah, that, that's, it's, that's a tough one. Yeah, great question. Yes? Yes, so the question is, are photons, is photons light? Now, I, I use the word light very loosely, very loosely. Uh, when I say light, so there's, yeah, I should say this. When I say light, there's visible light. That's the stuff you and I see. And there's invisible light, and that's everything else. So you could think of your cell phone signal as invisible light. You could go to the doctor and get an x-ray. You could think of that as invisible light. So the, the, reason I wanna, the reason I even said light is I want us to not think there's light. There's radio waves. There's microwaves. There's Wi-Fi. There's cell phone. They're all the same thing. So you could call them light. You can call them photons. Let's call it maybe the technical term, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, there, the homework due to, on Friday is called EMR. So it's all forms of electromagnetic radiation, which you could call light, I guess. Yeah, it's just not all, it's not all, in, it's not all visible. OK, uh, let's see here. So Yeah, so that's, I think that's what, where I want us to get, go today, is I want us to understand there's this vast array of things that light is responsible for. Uh, light is, all light that I was just describing is all electromagnetic radiation, EMR. And this whole continuum or spectrum of different wavelength and frequencies is called the electromagnetic spectrum. There is a chart of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so you can see across the top, I've got a list of some of the things we typically think of that we, that we kind of use it for, that it represents. So we've got radio waves, microwaves, infrared. So we've got the visible part of the spectrum. And if you look at the frequency, that middle black band with the rainbow in the middle, there's this little range in the middle where our optic sensors are sensitive to. And we'll talk more probably next class. There's a pretty good reason for that. We happen to orbit a star that outputs most of its light in that band. So we, light-sensitive creatures, have evolved sensitive to that band that our star mostly puts out. And so our, all, a lot of the creatures on this planet have evolved to be sensitive to the light that they get during the day they, they're receiving all day. 
So if you had optic sensors that were really, really sensitive, you know, eyeballs, if you had eyeballs that were really, really sensitive to infrared light, uh, that would be OK, I guess, for like heat seeking, but it would not be great for run out running into trees, which are not that warm. So uh, if you're walking around in a room where everything's room temperature, you know, having, IR, having like heat signature light uh, eyeballs wouldn't be very useful because everything's room temperature. You, would, you could see the people. People would look like little light bulbs, but um, trees would, you'd probably run into them. So there's this whole electromagnetic spectrum with visible light in the middle. Anything to the left of red, see how it goes, Roy G. Biv, we're all familiar with that. Anything to the left of red, we call infrared. Anything to the right of violet, we call ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is beyond violet. And then past that, you've got the dangerous stuff, like x-rays and gamma rays. So you usually want to avoid the stuff to the right of purple. So when you go outside, our beautiful sun that makes all life possible actually puts out, we'll talk more about this probably next class, puts out a whole, the whole spectrum. It puts out all of that. And so the, our sun is trying to kill us as much as it's also providing light. And so the sun is putting out x-rays and gamma rays all day long. And a lot of that stuff kind of in the ultraviolet makes it through our atmosphere. Fortunately, our atmosphere shields us from a lot of it. But our atmosphere lets through even on cloudy days, so watch it when you're outside on a cloudy day. A lot of the, uh, the clouds let through ultraviolet, and that gives you sunburns and skin cancer. So watch that. Um, so right there, actually, already you're seeing the, yeah, the difference, and that's kind of the main thing we're talking about today, is the difference in behavior based simply on the wavelength and frequency. So I can take a photon, and it will be, it'll be blocked by clouds. Clouds, it bounces off clouds, or is absorbed by clouds. I can take that photon and just shift its frequency a little bit. It zips right through clouds. And so if you are receiving a cell phone uh, text message, like you are, like some people are right now, if you're receiving a text message, that text message came from outside this room. It came from a cell tower, unless you're connected to Wi-Fi. That cell tower is miles away sometimes. How did that photon get in this room? It went right through brick and plaster and everything else between us and that cell phone tower. So it passed right through the building. Visible light does not. So when I look up, I can't see the sky. I might say the ceiling's opaque, but that's a, not the best, the most descriptive term. That ceiling is opaque to what I call visible light. That ceiling is transparent. That is a window to other types of light. So if you ever watch like 24 or some CTU, uh, I don't know, show where they they need to find out where all the terrorists are in the building and they they can look at it with that camera and all the little people are are visible lights inside that that's that's relatively uh realistic that you can do that so uh this building is transparent to infrared light and so right now i'm a light bulb that you could see from the from a, the room the adjacent room if you just had the right type of camera okay so let's talk let's see Let's, we're going to get to microwaves. We're going to microwave some stuff, I promise. Uh, just, let's see, just uh, to go in order, we're going to start with radio. So let's start with radio waves and get to microwaves. And if we do that today, that's a good day. So let's talk a little bit about radio. That's the far side. And then we're going to get to microwaves. And that's our goal for the day, to learn a little bit about those. So the main thing you need to know, they're both, when you listen to the radio, the signal that's coming to your car, photons. When you microwave your food, photons. Oh, and by the way, your cell phone, this is how we ended last class, photons. Here's another chart, uh, slightly more crowded. Um, here's some of the, the things that uh, we use photons for. I don't know if any of that is visible from the back, but the only reason I bring that one up, um, it's got a little more information on it. It's kind of cool where you get to see uh, a size reference. And so up at the top, a size reference. So when you are listening to the radio, those are actually really large waves sometimes kilometers long waves. They're, they can be very big. And so light is sizeless, but the wave is often in a very human scale. So the wave might be yay big. And so when you're listening to FM radio, uh, they're like a meter or so. So yeah, they're like yay big. So even though they're sizeless and they're going the speed of light insanely, insanely fast, they're about yay big. And as they pass over your antenna, that's a, one wavelength is about a meter. Okay, 
Um, the reason I bring that one up, oh yeah, just to see, if you look at the microwave oven, that's 2.4 gigahertz. So that's the frequency, 2.4 billion times a second, which is crazy to think that a wave, anything could happen 2.4 billion times in one second. That's crazy, but that's what's going on. It's going up and down 2.4 billion times a second. That's your microwave. Just above that, Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz. Just above that, cell phones, 2.4 gigahertz. That should give you pause. That should be a little bit scary. Hopefully by the end of class, we'll be a little less scared about that. But like I said, let's start with radios. So these, there's these things called photons, one of the great things that we figured out to do with them, one of the things they're really useful for is they travel very fast and they can go very far. So we humans have figured out not too long ago that if I want to communicate with someone greater than shouting distance away, I can send photons to them. So these photons, can, they go the speed of light, and so I can send a signal from here to, all photons go the speed of light by definition. I can send a signal from here to LA in, oh geez, uh, uh, like a 20th of a second or something like that, that's crazy. Um, short, way shorter than that. I don't do the math. Goes a foot and a billionth of, anyway. Um, so I can send photons to communicate very far, very fast. So we have, we use radios to do that. Real quick, we should know that when I tune into AM, a couple things I want you to know about AM. When I tune into AM, Let's see, in Charlottesville, 1060, I think, is the channel. When I turn into, tune into AM 1060, that 1060 represents the frequency. And it represents the frequency in kilohertz. So you might have seen, oh, there it is on my little picture, down at the bottom, KHZ. So that's kilohertz, or thousandths of a hertz. So when I tune into AM 1060, what that means is that station has contracted with the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, so they said, okay, we're going to build an antenna. That antenna is going to send out waves at 1060, 1060, 1,000 times a second. That's the frequency my wave is going to go up and down. Now, if I just had a wave that went up and down, that wouldn't be very interesting. That would just sound like a boop all day long. That's not that interesting. What, what an AM radio station does is they amplitude modulate their signal. AM, amplitude modulation. And so what they can do is they can embed data, voice, music, sports, whatever you're putting in there. You can embed data by changing the amplitude. That's the height of your wave. So if you're actually to picture an amplitude modulated wave, it looks like this. It's the same frequency, 1060. So it's the same frequency, but it might change in amplitude. So I'm trying to draw the same frequency as I do that. So the waves are the same frequency apart. And so if I, were, if I had an antenna, tuned to AM 1060, waves are passing over my antenna, and they're passing at the same rate. They're, I'm getting 1,060,000, 1, so what is that, One, about a million. I'm getting about a million waves every second, bup, 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 hitting my antenna. I'm getting about a million waves, but their amplitude is slightly bigger and smaller. Their height is slightly bigger and smaller. That is where the data comes from. The data comes from the fact that it's not just a constant wave, but it's amplitude modulated. Next, I hit the FM button on my radio, and now I'm tuned in to 106.1 the corner, and that's 106.1 megahertz. When I, when, when any, any FM radio station, and again, my picture shows that, any FM radio station, when you tune in to 103.5, that's 103.5 million times per second, or million waves per second. So when I tune in to 103.5, that's 103.5 million waves are passing over my antenna every second. That's a lot. How do, I encode wait, how do I encode data in an FM signal? That's frequency modulated. It's frequency modulated, so my amplitude's the same, but I can slightly vary the frequency. So my amplitude should stay the same here, but I can, uh, I can change the frequency. So when the FCC says, all right, 106.1 in the corner, you have to transmit on 106.1, what they mean is you can transmit on like 106.05 to 106.15. There's a little range. So it's, it's around 106.5, but the data is actually in the fact that there is frequency modulation, that the, the frequency of the wave changes a little bit. That's FM radio. Yes? Yes. So the question was, when you, if you've ever 
These are harder to come by these days. If you ever like manually tuned a radio, yeah. So let yeah let, let's talk a little bit about how antennas work. And so what you're doing is you're changing the frequency that your antenna is listening to. And so you, to listening to 106.1, you're gonna really you're dead on. You're gonna get that signal. When you're at 106.15, you're getting like half of the signal. And then you go 106.16, 17. You're still getting some of that signal, but you're starting to bump into the other signal. And depending on where you are, the signals might be stacked, where it's literally 106.15 and then 106.16, we're picking up another channel. So when you're out driving around somewhere far away, there might be gaps, and you're just like snuffing but static for a while. Then all of a sudden, you start picking up someone else's signal. Um, yeah, really quick, it, it, I do want to talk about uh, briefly how antennas work. I don't want to get too much into the crazy physics details, but here's what I want you to know. It's a, uh, it's a pretty brilliant concept um, in electronics that we use to transmit and receive these signals. And so I guess here's the first thing you need to know, is that here's how I make a photon, or here's how I make electromagnetic radiation. Here's one way I can do it. First of all, I can do it by being above absolute zero. So right now, I'm making photons right now. So right now, I'm shooting off, I don't know, something like 300 million photons every second. So I'm emitting photons. You guys are all emitting photons. You guys are all like light bulbs right now. You're just not in the visible range. Um, here's another way you can take photons. You can actually just accelerate an electric charge. That's important to know. So if I accelerate an electric charge, it will actually radiate photons. That's all I need to do. So what I can do is take a wire. That's my antenna over there on the left. I can just take a wire and run a current up and down it. And when that current accelerates up and down the wire, boom, I get electromagnetic radiation. It's pretty easy to do. Now here's the clever part. When the, when the FCC says, all right, you have, to, you, have to, you have to send your waves out at 106.1 million times a second, how do you do that? What I need to do, I need to build a circuit that resonates at 106.1 billion times a second. That is called a tank circuit, and you're looking at a picture of one on the right. That's called a tank circuit. And the reason it's called a tank, if you've ever had a fish tank and accidentally bumped it and watched the water slosh back and forth, that's almost exactly what's happening in a tank circuit. A tank circuit takes electric charge, puts it in something called a capacitor. We don't need to know what that is right now, but it puts it in something called a capacitor. That's the thing on the right. The top right, you see two plates. Uh, those two plates on the right, that's a capacitor. It puts a bunch of electrons. A bunch of electrons, a bunch of electric charge. And the, those electrons discharge, in other words, they, yeah, they send current into the thing just to the left. That's called an inductor or a solenoid. Yeah, inductor or solenoid. That actually creates a magnetic field. And so what we've, just in the last couple days, we've talked about there's this thing called electromagnetism. One of the beauties of electromagnetism is that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. A changing electric field creates a magnetic field. In fact, that's how photons even work. How do you get a wave to just shoot through space? How does the sun send things that sort of self-propagate all the way here, heat and light? Those waves of electricity and magnetism are actually kind of self-replicating each other. They're, they're, they're self-sustaining. And so a changing electric field will create a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field will create an electric field. So in my tank circuit, I build a capacitor and I discharge it into a coil of wire that creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field builds up and then it actually collapses and that changing magnetic field creates electric field that recharges my capacitor. And that, ha that will slosh back and forth very rapidly. And I can build myself a tank circuit that will slosh back and forth at the frequency I want to transmit. So here I am, 106.1 in the corner. FCC says you need to transmit a 106.1 million times a second. I build a tank circuit that oscillates at 106.1 million times a second. It's very fast. And that accelerates charges up and down my antenna 106.1 million times a second. That blasts out photons that are going 106.1 million times a second. Then on the other side, you see the receiver just to the right of my antenna. That receiver is just the same circuit in reverse. That receiver is just an antenna sitting there waiting for, a, for photons to pass by. So I stick my antenna up on top of my car, on top of my house, and it's just a piece of metal waiting for photons. Those photons pass by, 
And those po photons are waves of electric field that actually excite they actually excite the charges in my antenna, the, the electrons in my antenna, and I, get, I can read the signal. And the thing is, I actually tune the tank circuit on my side to resonate at what station I want. So I tune my tank circuit to resonate at 106.1. It won't resonate at 105. It won't resonate at 107. It'll only resonate what I tuned it to. And so most tank circuits have like a variable capacitor that changes the resonant frequency. Question? The, uh, the question is about electric and magnetic fields. They're going at right angles to one another. So the electric field is doing this, and the magnetic field is doing this. I can't do that, but yeah. Or it's doing, they're always at right angles. So it could be like this, but it could be like that. But they're always at right angles. One's going up, the other one's going sideways, or yeah. OK. That's enough about radios. Let's get to microwaves, and then we can microwave some stuff. So um, microwaves are actually very similar. Here's my, I'm going to, let's see. Got a microwave up here. That's my microwave. There it is. OK. Inside that microwave are some beautiful things. That little oval-shaped thing. If you ever take your, and take your microwave apart, don't touch that oval-shaped thing, that one. That's a huge, huge, huge capacitor that, if it's been plugged in recently, has a lot of charge in it. It'll discharge. I don't know if anyone, if you've ever taken apart a disposable camera, I don't know if anyone would have done that, and accidentally touched the capacitor, it, it's like a taser. It'll really give you a good jolt. Anyway, that thing's like a taser, so don't touch that. This thing right here is called a transformer. This transforms the voltage at the wall from 120. That's what we have, you know, the power company gives us. Transforms it up to, that one doesn't say. It's usually around 4,000 volts. So that's a 4,000 volt transformer. And then the, here's the beautiful thing. This thing right here, this is called the magnetron. Great word, magnetron. The magnetron is a bunch of little tank circuits like I just described in the for the radio. So a magnetron is a bunch of tank circuits, and I can excite those, and those will oscillate at 2.4 gigahertz. They'll oscillate at 2.4 gigahertz and create photons and fill the inside of my microwave with these 2.4 gigahertz photons. Put that back on there. So let's, I think we've, we voted first for the match, I think, is that right? Yep, okay. So let's, let's microwave a match and talk about what's going to happen. Let's microwave a match. We have, yeah, plenty of time. Okay. Let's see. So here's what's going to happen. So pretty much everything we're going to do today, and everything, like pretty much everything we've talked about already, has to do with electric charges, electrons. So when I pass that wave past something, when I send that wave past something, the red part, the electric field, is going to take the particle, the anything charged, to take anything charged, like an electron, and jiggle it. And that can have some pretty cool effects. So when I light this match, it's going to create some soot. It's going to create some uh, free electrons in the air. So I'm going to create a little cloud of electrons, ionized gas. I'm going to create a little cloud of electrons. So I've got this bunch of electrons, in other words, just charged gas above the match. I'm going to trap it underneath a, um, a beaker. When I send an electric wave past those electrons, those electrons are going to start zipping around. And what, something we'll maybe not get totally into today, maybe next class, is that when you zip electrons around, they will emit light. Uh, let's try it. Um, we're, we're running low on time, so I don't want to get too much into the details, because we have some stuff to microwave. Um, okay, so here's a nice burning match. Put this in here. Okay, you can see it. Now I'm actually going to wait for it to go. Let's see. I haven't operated this. Now I will maybe not get this in the first, like, it, this might take like three or four tries. That one did nothing. Okay.
all of, well, yeah, this one, this one will take a few tries. The other ones are more surefire. So what I'm doing is I'm collecting ionized gas. I'm collecting free electrons up here. I like to wait till it just right as it's going out. There we go. Nada. All right, we're going to keep doing this. I'm collecting more gas. This is going to work, I promise. Put multiple matches in there. I only have one hole in this little cork here. All right, this is going to work. Uh, it went out, but that still, still might work. Nope. It's just, I'm just building up suspense. It's going to be awesome, trust me. Okay. Oh, you know what? That might, this also might be in a dead spot, which is something we're going to talk about later. Come on, that's not cool enough. <laughs> nope, that was kind of cool, not not cool enough. Um, microwaves have dead spots. I'm gonna keep moving this match around to see if I maybe I'm in a dead spot. I have to like jack up the power or something on this guy. All right, well, this is going to work, I promise. Let's see. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it while it's burning. You know, I should microwave something else, make sure this microwave even works. All right. Sure. There we go. That. That was pretty cool. So, okay, that worked. Nice. Thank you. That, that's called plasma. So you just saw plasma in real life. Not often do you see plasma in real life. Plasma is a cloud of charged particles. Take a cloud of charged particles, send an electric wave through there, and you get lots and lots of cool photons. So we were getting visible light out of that. So I had invisible microwaves going there, exciting the gas, and the excited gas got emitted photons, emitted photons in the visible spectrum. Okay, let's microwave a couple of other things before we're done. We still have three minutes left. Um, I don't remember what was next. Let's do a CD. Okay, here's my CD. So a CD, as you, you can probably just tell much by looking at it, a CD is coated with a metallic film. Met anything metallic, like the definition of metal, if you remember from chemistry class, the definition of metal is it has free electrons in it. So that metal has electrons just sitting, waiting to be pushed around. So I'm going to send in again that red wave. That red wave is going to push on the electrons in the metal, and they're going to start zipping around. And there's very little resistance to that zipping. And so they'll go very fast and get hot, and they'll start sparking. So let's try that. So you can see the sparks, and it's basically vaporizing the coating. And then, I think I got a fire in there. OK. Let's do one more real quick. Let's do another CD. Let's, we're going to do a CD and... We'll do a CD, hey, class. We're going to do a CD and some tin foil and one other metal thing, and then we're going to call it a day. So we're going to do another CD. Again, so to watch that, there's, these, there's metal in there. There's a metal coating. That metal coating has electrons in it. They're going to start zipping around in a circuit. As they zip around, they're going to create heat because they're literally bumping into the molecules, and that's going to start vaporizing the metal coating. Then you're going to start getting sparks as the electrons literally jump over gaps. That's the sparks. It's like a little lightning. And then once the coating's pretty much vaporized, it's the end of the show. And that's, there we go. So as those, you can kind of see the gaps in the coating. And the CD is also starting to uh, deform, and you can see that as well. 
All right, let's do some tin foil and a ball, and then we're done. The tin foil is actually very similar in that it's metal, it's aluminum. I called it tin. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I, it's metal, it's metal, it's aluminum, I think. This is, al it's aluminum foil. It's aluminum foil, so I've got electrons in there that are going to get pushed around by the electromagnetic wave. At the sharp corners, at the sharp corners, the field, the electric field will be strong enough, will be concentrated basically at the sharp corners. This thing has lots of little sharp corners. The electric field will be concentrated enough. The electrons will jump out into, the, into space. They'll ionize the air around them, and they'll create like tiny lightning. Let's do 10 seconds. That's probably enough of that. OK. <laughs> I made a fire, and it's hot. OK. The last thing I'm going to cook, the last thing I'm going to cook is this metal ball. This metal ball made of solid steel. I'm going to put that in the middle so you can see it. There it is, metal ball. Actually, we're going to do one more after this one. because I don't want to end on this one because nothing's going to happen. It's a metal ball. It's got no sharp corners. Right now, there's electrons zipping around being pushed and pulled by the electric field. That's about it. There's not a lot of resistance, so it's not going to create a lot of heat. Uh, that was pretty boring. So that was a, so the idea that you can't put metal and didn't even really warm up. The, the idea that you can't put metal in a microwave is a little bit misleading. You can put metal if it's not doesn't have sharp corners and it's thick. You're usually gonna be okay. Let's put the light bulb in. Then we'll call it a day. This light bulb has a metal filament. That metal filament is gonna act like a little antenna. And as those electric waves pass over the antenna, I should be able to get visible light out of this and. If I'm lucky, I should be able to get some plasma inside the bulb. So the gas inside the bulb might actually uh, ionize. I should get some plasma. I'm going to go eight seconds on this, because I can't explode it if I go too long. So that's plasma. That's not what a light bulb is supposed to look like. There we go. That was pretty sweet. OK, we'll explain a little bit more about what we just saw in next class. See you Friday. <laughs>